Okay, for this part of the course, we're going to be getting into a lot of statistics and graphing, so topics having to do with data analysis. And so to accomplish this, we are going to be working with a software program known as R. And Dr. Burke and I are both uh, really big fans of working with R because it has, um, it's a very powerful um, software program. And uh, so to kind of get you started with R, I thought I'd talk a little bit about the history and the types of things that R lets us accomplish. So history, um, uh, R actually started out as a fork of another software programming language called the S language, which was developed by a research lab run by AT&T, um, so back in the 1970s. So R got um, uh, translated from S in 1993, and at that point, the um, programmers who made the decision to translate it also made a really important decision to make R open source, and I'll talk more about what that means in a minute. Uh, four years later, um, they established an international R core team, um, and they set up some mailing lists, and the number of participants using R started to grow. And so by two, the year 2000, the first full version of R was released. And so then following that in the early to mid 2000s, uh, the community of um, R users really started to grow and contributed to the effort of continuing to develop R. And so that then fast forward to today, um, there, it's one of the main software programs that's used for a lot of this work around the globe. And uh, it's available for us to take advantage of all the work of, of these programmers over the years. But what does it actually mean for you, for us? Well, the thing is, the nice thing about R is that it can be all that you will ever need in terms of analyzing your data. So uh, we'll, we aren't gonna spend quite as much time on this uh, topic in this course, but uh, it can be incredibly powerful for getting your data in shape. So um, here's some example data. Uh, so just measuring sizes of different insect species. So we've got a bunch of grasshoppers, flies, and beetles, and then their sizes. And there's a function called the summarize function that will let us uh, summarize and calculate automatically the average size for each of those groups. And I have a couple of notes on some of the syntax here on this slide. Um, and uh, there's, we can kind of go down quite a rabbit hole here, uh, but it can help, you can just accomplish tasks like this with just a single line of code. Uh, sometimes another thing that can happen is you might have some information in one form and then other information in another form. So here's that species and size data and here's uh, species and then the, um, the order uh, for those uh, insect species and maybe you want to have all that information together. So there's a way to merge uh, different data sets. And you might have something more like this. So here's uh, measuring the numbers of uh, insects at different sites, sites A through G. And you know maybe you want to know, uh, well, how many grasshoppers, flies, and beetles were found um, across all those sites. So there's a way to transform that data to a different format to uh, more easily compare different sites. And it looks like D is pretty exciting here. So it can help with getting your data in shape. Uh, it is also a tremendously powerful tool for analyzing your data, so um, uh, calculating statistics. And there's a particular component of it um, called the base package um, that contains functions that will let you do uh, all the statistics that we're going to do in this course. So uh, things from a t-test to uh, regression to the analysis of variance, and there's even a way to do a uh, chi-square analysis, and much, much fancier statistics if uh, you carry on to do more statistics. And I'll put in a shameless plug here for Dr. Burks's biostats course. Um, if you discover, like Dr. Burke and myself, that you love statistics, that's a fantastic course to continue developing your statistics tool set. And that's not all. One of the most amazing things about R is that it's continuing to grow. So it's really an expanding universe. So um, last time I updated this was back in uh, 2018, um, but 
but still makes the point. So back in 2010, there were, you know, 2,600 contributed packages. And we'll talk a little more about packages later on. By 2014, we were up to 5,000, almost 5,600 packages. And by 2018, that more than doubled up to 12,507 packages. And so um, each of these packages is kind of a subset of functions um, that you can use in, in R. So um, <clears throat> if you've ever used a program like um, Adobe Illustrator, sometimes you'll notice it takes a while for the program to load. And as it's loading, you'll, you might see a little message that tells you it's loading this, that, and the other thing. Usually those little pieces are different packages that get loaded that provide different types of functionality in that program. So um, here are some examples of uh, some of the packages, just a small number of these, uh, more than 12,000 packages. Uh, and we'll see a couple of these as we go through the course. So you have all kinds of strange names like Ape and LME4 and aid habitat and the the vegan package is a um, really big one for ecologists there's an r google maps package to work with uh, so you can do some mapping work swiss air has um, a uh, ton of uh, data on air quality in switzerland believe it or not and there's even a sudoku package that will uh, let you generate and solve uh, sudoku puzzles so and i'm sure there are other fun packages as well on top of that uh, R is really fantastic for visualizing data. So um, I'm showing you some really fancy graphs here from some of my research projects, just to give you a sense of this. And um, <clears throat> one of the most amazing things is that uh, a lot of the default behavior when making plots uh, generates really good looking graphics. So on the left hand side, um, there's a couple, these are um, uh, heat maps, um, just showing measurements of some traits in the crickets that I study. So I've got the short wing crickets and the long wing crickets. Um, and by the way, there are 13 different treatment groups in that experiment. It's a lot of work getting replicates for that. And then on the right hand side, um, I've got some graphs of from some leafcutter ant colonies where I did things like counted the number of workers in colonies for a 14 week time period. And so you can see that here and then uh, also represented as a bar plot. So pretty good looking plots, all things considered. Publication quality. Here's another example of um, a graphic that includes a map and a bunch of plots. So all this done in R. And, you know, R is open source. So for us, one of the great benefits is that means it's free, but there are other benefits as well, which is if we needed to, we could look under the hood at all of the algorithms and how they're implemented in R. So if you know there's something about how the t-test is calculated that uh, we want to change, we could make our own t-test. And um, the, there are a lot of active forums for R users, and so those forums are really helpful for exploring and expanding um, how to analyze data. And um, because it's free and open source, that means that scientists around the world, not just scientists who can afford to pay money for uh, statistical software, um, can be co-owners of the tools that we need to do research. And um, collectively, this promotes something that we now talk about as reproducible research because the tools are open and accessible. So I could repeat somebody else's analysis um, or I could repeat their experiments um, and uh, this is a big help in being able to do that. So that all sounds great, but there are some catches. So one of them is, um, this is a, an example of loading base R only, so not using R Studio. Um, if you just opened up R by itself, um, this is what you might see. And so if you're trying to get started, you might look at this and think, what do I do? I don't know what to do. There's just a cursor here at a command line. Also, um, it's kind of a bit of a wild west, so it's not always a well-organized system, and there's no single source of commercial support or any all-in-one manual for how to use it. And so oftentimes figuring out an analysis or how to use a function on your own can be very frustrating. So we're going to talk more about that specifically, about what to do to get help and how to work through that frustration. 
and you have to learn a new language. So, you know, starting out, this is probably going to look like uh, something totally incomprehensible, but um, with time and with practice, uh, you'll be able to understand it. But it's a lot, because software really is learning a new language. But I'd like to argue that ultimately this is a good thing, because what R does is it will give you a written record of your data manipulations and your analyses. And because R is a programming language, it can repeat actions thousands of times, and you don't have to move or do anything for it to repeat those actions. Um, if you spend a lot of time in spreadsheets, you may discover that you wind up doing a lot of really repetitive things in spreadsheets, and R will eliminate that. And R also gives you very precise control, so you get the exact analysis or figure that you want. If that wasn't enough, there's a little more to it. So R can also save you from some pretty terrible nightmares. And you may not encounter these so much in this course, but uh, you could encounter them later on. So here's uh, one uh, potential horrifying scenario. So let's say you've been working on a project uh, some years ago, and then um, another researcher requests your data. And so you go, okay, well, I can send you my data, no problem. And you go back and you realize you have four different versions of that data set with very slight variations in the sample size and the treatment groups. So then you're going, I don't know which of these versions is the right one. Um, what do, ah, I'm stuck, what do I do? So the great thing about working with R is once you have compiled your data set, so you put it together, then you no longer do any alterations to your data set. Your data set stays exactly the same. So uh, any changes after the fact happen in your R script, not to the original data. And so as a result, your data files will remain pristine and untouched. So here's another one. Um, so again, this won't, may not happen in our course, but uh, could happen sometime down the road. So let's say um, you're working on a project and then you needed to take a break and then you came back to it later. And when you came back to it later, you have no idea how you did your original analyses. So spend hours and hours and hours just trying to figure out what did I even do with these data. So working with R, um, you will do all of your analyses in a script file, and you'll save that script file. It's just a simple text file. But what it means is that you can have complete documentation of exactly what you did. And so this is really great for people like me who have a far less than perfect memory. Um, you can have a bad memory, but you can still pick up very close to where you left off. That does involve uh, you know, leaving yourself good notes in your script file, but that's entirely possible. So um, all said and done, uh, I thought this quote was kind of a, an appropriate one for what it feels like to learn uh, how to use R. So using R is a bit akin to smoking. The begin is, beginning is difficult, and one may get, a, get headaches and even gag the first few times, but in the long run, it becomes pleasurable and even addictive. Yet deep down, for those willing to be honest, there's something not fully healthy in it.